Byrgir við fengum hérna tveggja dag asaloku. Allar árnar margfölduðust, brúnu við stóru lags og nýju var bjarga með einhverjum aðgerðum. Já, ég er búin að sjá vídeo þetta, rosalegt. Nú er aftur komið frost. Ég yes. Eru <laughs> prímaloftbuxunar yfir gallabuxunar á mótnana. Þegar bílinn er kaldur, golden. Golden, það er fyndið að sjá þig að koma hérna á mótnana á skrifstofuna. Það er dalli dúa þar bara. Já, ég fór og, og hérna talaði við hann andra hvíta kúpumannin og hann græja mig upp í þessu eitthvað í haust og reyndist mér ákallega vel í hérna haustuðinni og, og svo er þetta búið að standa með mann í vetur, það verður ekki annað sagt Já, þetta er góður svona staðal búnaður fyrir okkur veðimenn sko. Já, en kíkinni í veðiflugur ég fekk mér líka hérna svartan bökk til, ég er búin að sakna hérna bökk til sönnreyðana Já, þú er farin í þessu svona klassíska svona Já, hvítúpa bökk til, þetta, þetta er svona hálftranspárant, það er eitthvað, eitthvað sex í við þetta Já, það Já, þetta er þessi þáttu verið að ennsku hjá okkur og Já. svolítið svona rauðu þráður í gegnum þetta í sjúbyrtingur Já, við fengum að Maros menn þekkja kannski sem djónguleðu trát þetta er hérna slóvaki hérna sem býr á kirkjubæðiklustri fyrir það sem ekki þekkja og hann á sér nokkuð merkilega svo náttúrulega endar hérna á tilfyrir tilvilin á Íslandi hefur keft í flugu yfir í landsliði slóvaka í íþróttinni og hann hefur svona okkur skoðanir á því farið víða að vera glengin og bara Íslandi líkku við sko, leiðist mér að segja síðan fimm ár bara veitt til dæmis bara skafta og það svæði eitthvað við líka mikið sko Nei, hann er, hann er fanatísku veðmaður hann, hann er fanatísku veðmaður og við fáum nokkuð skellað eins í fyrst mér á, á þetta allt saman og, og við erum bara nokkuð víða en, en já, sjóbyrtingunum klálega rauðu þráðurinn og hver er bestu vinnurinn með eru við henni, bestu vinnurinn á bakarum Það er, það er léttölið oh, Já, við ekki gildur góða minningar og hérna <laughs> bestu bílkaldur og allt það og hérna, en ég, veit, ég hérna slökti í nokkrum við ekki bónda hérna um helgina og þetta var þetta. ég er virkilega þakklátur þegar við ekki einhverja standa með okkur í þessu brasi og svo er það sjálfsu loopmerch.is já. ekki skilja bakið eftir á bakanum allt aftur í dolluna og hérna Njótið. Maros, welcome to Hillerin. Hi, thank you for having me. So, you are from Slovakia. Yeah, that's correct. So, did fishing start for you there? Yep, it starts uh, in Slovakia. I grew up in a mountain area where I was surrounded with the rivers, which are still considered as one of the only wild rivers in Slovakia. There is not dams, even though there is uh, dams now. At the beginning of the years, there was almost no dams, and yeah, I had walking distance from my house usually to the this spot. And when I was a little kid, I was always standing by the river and watching the people fishing there. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's how I kind of get into it. My father was fishing when I was very little, but it was more like a carp fishing. But then I became starved with the fly fishing when I was 12 years old. I st- yeah. So I think a lot of our listeners will maybe be familiar with Slovenia as a destination. Is it sort of similar fishing, similar water types and, um, and species? Slovenia, Slovenia, it's the the waters are different. They're coming from the Alps. They are much cleaner. The mm-hmm. the the the, the, <coughs> the color of the rivers is different. I think in Slovakia, the the particular river where I'm where I grow up, it's very similar. It's uh it's this rocky, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, bottom and the water is super clear coming from the mountains. So that particular river I would consider as a Slovenian, but then the different rivers are different types. Of the, the so river. what would you be fishing for in Slovakia? What I, fi- what I start the, fishing for? Yeah, re- brown trout, the brown grayling. trout, brown trout, and the grayling was the yeah the mm-hmm. main fish I was targeting there when I started fly fishing. And uh, do you have the same species as like the marble trout and the hucho? And no, the the marble trout it's uh, endemic just in these areas of the Italy on the small ta- uh, small part of Italy and then Slovenia. Mm-hmm. So in Slovakia, well, it's the similar names, but it's a different countries. They're, yeah, they're not course. even like a neighbor countries. There's a Hungary in between. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't. Yeah, it's a different country. So yeah. we we have mostly the brown trout, which is native in these areas. Then we have uh, the chops, graylings. There is a native hucho, which is uh, all in all branches of the Danube River. Mm-hmm. And there's also some white fish like a barbel and different types of the yeah 
but mostly we're focusing on uh, on on brown trout grayling and of course the now in these years they are stocking the rainbows in a, in the rivers not just these years and already the rainbows start even spawning in some of the rivers big in Slovakia how do you feel about that well i feel maybe the same way as americans start feeling about the browns in the mm-hmm. uh, us they are starting to you know putting the browns about the about the native species like the brookies and uh, and uh, and the rainbows which are native in the us and here of course the rainbows can hold kind of worse quality of the water so they becoming in some of the rivers even bigger than the brown trout you know mm-hmm. but of course i think most of the people want to bring or keep the brown trout as a main species in this mm-hmm. in these rivers so when you started how how were you fishing for these fish and were remember, you successful right away yeah actually I, i remember i was i start fly tying when i was 11 it was winter time so there was not the fishing season and i remember i had just this vice which is not even for fly tying it was you know this like for for uh, for carpentry work or something and i was using the hooks that i found in my father box which was carp hooks mm-hmm. and using the threads from my mom and uh, i remember i was taking the materials from her fox coat and then <laughs> cutting it off that was my first you know tying and like the dry uh, dry flies or some books there was not so many information there was on internet so mm-hmm. there was not so many information at that point but i had some books i got and i i know how the dry flies or wet flies looks like so i was just tying like you know the the flies like three centimeters long with uh, several f- several wings on them which was completely messed up but then <laughs> i remember i tied the uh, red tuck that i that's mm-hmm. one of the basic flies and i went w- to the creek first time alone and i got a brown try so you remember it was like 30 centimeter brown try on the dry on that fly that i tied nice. when i was 12 years old at that time yeah is it a popular sport in slovakia fly yeah fishing? yeah yeah oh. also i think in whole europe the fly fishing it's quite popular and in slovakia it's definitely one of the main main type of the fishing i mean we always see when you when you look at competitive fly fishing you always see the eastern europeans ranked very yeah, high yeah yeah Yeah, also the competing in back Slovakia is a big thing. I mean, it, if we touch on that, did you participate in competitive fishing at all? Yeah, actually I kind of jump into competing quite early. And I start competing for some uh, teams. And it was like, there's the different uh, types of the competing, you know, there's like different levels of them. Mm-hmm. And I started in the lower one with the friends and somehow I get in a... World na- uh, Slovakian national team, mm-hmm. and I actually went to the first yacht uh, na- national team of Slovakia when I was 14. We went to the U.S. and then I was like three time in world champion, like in world championships. Ah, wonderful! Yeah, in U.S. and 2016 in in Portugal, where we became a second, and then uh, in the Czech Republic, and when I was 18 years old. Uh, that's very not in Icelandic culture very much not in Icelandic culture there's sort of competing and fishing at least not I mean a lot of people obviously compete you don't you only need to go to a lot to figure that out but sort of organized competition but uh, I sort of got obsessed with this a few years ago looking at this competitive and what what people are thinking there because you can learn a lot of stuff from them because it's all very mathematic of how you use your time and 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 all of that uh, So did you take, uh, I mean, do you still today take a lot of parts from your competitive days into your fishing? Well, definitely it was a really technical thing. Well, we have a we have a coach. We're having the the meetings. We're like training and we're making the the, the list how we're going to target each river, uh, different different uh, techniques. And like we were talking about basically like what knots we're going to make. We're practicing mm-hmm. the knots like short the time, you know. So you, you're going to spend most of the time for, for actual fishing. Yeah, becoming efficient. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's, it's about the numbers. It's about numbers, yeah. uh, definitely. And I've also seen people discussing, you know, instead of catching big fish, it's better for the sh- how they score the competitions to catch a lot of small fish. Definitely, because you're getting point for each fish. For example, like 10 points for fish and then points for length. So for you, it's better to catch two 20-centimeter fish 
mm-hmm. than 140 centimeter fish. Because yeah. you can catch a lot more 20s. Yeah, yeah, that. and fighting is shorter, and then you can, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's definitely, you, you're focusing more on, on quantity at that point. So let's say, uh, if just because I think this is very foreign to most of our listeners, the competitive fishing world. If we are competing on a on fishing on on a small river, sort of how how is it structured? How do you score points? Is there a judge following you? And and what is success in a competition like this? Usually the rivers are divided on uh, two sectors, and then you have a different beat on them, and you you drawing. So basically, it's gonna end up that you're gonna be the judge one round, and then you're gonna be fishing another round. So the 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 fishermen are the same as the judge, ah, you know, in between so the in between other. the rounds, yeah. And then you you have a uh, the measurement, which is like the plastic mm-hmm. tube where you have a uh, the measuring tape. You have a uh, you have a paper where you're writing the 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 catches, and then you have a certain time when you have to start fishing and finish fishing, and then trying to divide the river, kind of equally. Uh, of course, not always. You have to draw kind of mm-hmm. good to be success, but of course you can do the most on uh, each sector and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And then you uh, getting the points for each fish, and then you getting uh, points for 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 the length of the fish. I mean, how long does a fish have to be so you get an extra point for length? Or mm, you getting certain amount of the uh, points for the length, and then for each f- fish you yeah. getting the the points. Okay, I understand. But uh, yeah, it's it's very interesting to me, and and yeah, it's it's something that's so completely foreign to us Icelanders, uh, but what are the rules? I mean, I've heard of all sorts of one-fly competition, which is more are, in America, I think. Also in Europe, uh, they are they are organizing this uh, this uh, competition which have different type of the rules. The, you, there are competition on uh, lakes, for example, where you basically have two meters of the of the lake, and you mm-hmm. need to just f- fishing in front of you. Okay. And then you have a different rotation on these lakes. And then you have uh, also the, the competitions where you have one-fly only, and then you're fishing uh, one fly, usually yeah, either dry fly, nymph, whatever, but it always needs to be barbless hooks. And there's different also the rules, how how far the flies need to be uh, far from each other. Mm-hmm. If that, um, there's no like this rule for one fly only and yeah. But uh, I mean, uh, I think most competitions allow you to use two fly on a lead. Three flies. Three flies. Three flies. Yeah. So it's it's very sort of regulated. You cannot just show up with six flies. No, no, no. That's a rules also like general rules. I think in most of the European countries, you can use up to three flies. Mm-hmm. That's also when I start fly fishing and then like competing, I usually use rig of three flies for nymphing, usually one or two for dry fly. It depends also on the on the rivers and and yeah. They try to have this sort of try to get this going on uh, Icelandic Championship of trout fishing. Uh, quite a few years ago, they they cancelled it. But the last person to win it was Joe in Flubulan. Okay. So he's technically for the last twenty years still the Icelandic champion of of trout fishing. Well, okay. It would be interesting just for purely fun purposes to set something up like this that again. That would be fun. I, I was thinking about that because there are places. Do you think but, it would work here? Um, those are all wild rivers. Mm-hmm. It might be interesting. It would be different, you know. I think you could do a place like Varmo, where you have a lot of small fish yeah. everywhere. Yeah, that, that would be then very similar to Europe. Varmo in summertime yeah, would yeah, be yeah, yeah. very sort of European. Yeah. Even uh, they held it in, in uh, Bruarau okay. when it was last held and Joey won. And of course they could do it in, in Laxau, where there's plenty of trout yeah. up north. It would be interesting. Maybe we need to look into getting some sponsors per here for, for hosting an Icelandic for competition. championship. competition. Competition of... <laughs> Yeah, Mara's doing all the judging. Yeah, we would we would be doing some judging. It would be very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so uh, you, I mean, you've competed in world championship. We haven't had anyone in this in this show before who's who's been there. Was it? Uh, obviously, it's very sort of. I see in America, it's very debated. Is is competing in fishing healthy for the sport or not? What do you have an opinion? It's completely different, like type of the people. Mm-hmm. Like they're really just focusing, of course, on a uranium thing. And these days, mm-hmm. it's about the um, affecting the time of the getting the fish, and they really just trying to get most of the fish from the river. I from I stopped competing completely because it's like you're always rushing for something. You know, it's you have different feeling from it, 
and yeah, like I stopped uh, competing back in days, and I think I'm. I wouldn't like to get back into it. No. I know it's interesting for you, but for me, it's like the past I had before, and like. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, for me, it would. It sounds something which is so far away from what I've considered fishing to be, yeah, which yeah, is yeah. just you know good company, good That's time on the bank. That's completely different in and Iceland, and actually this. This type of the fishing in Iceland, I r like it a lot because this really just when you're focusing on the fishing that you are booking the, the days mm -hmm. then you're going there with the friends and then you're doing actually fishing, just having the meals together, going around the river, then you're just making the rotation in between each other. This is actual fishing, you know. I, mm -hmm. I wouldn't comp like compare to competing as as the, you know, yeah, at I the mean, fly fishing as it should be uh, or what is it when you're competing you know you're not showing your flies or telling about well, your it's, pools yeah or... it's even more secret of course and but understandable because like that's competing I, you know, I, in between I, different teams and yeah I'm not only going to ask you about this I, I, I promise but yeah, okay. uh, I must understand uh, so when you started and when you finished did you I mean when you started it was probably very much of this check nymph style going on and then when they start fishing no, in the in the competition. In the competition, yeah, definitely. There was most of the time nymphing. At that time, when I was uh, starting fly fishing, that the, when that Euro nymphing just like became as a thing. They were trying to figure out how to make the leaders, and that's when it started to casting uh, tungsten tungsten nymphs instead of the using the heavy nymph at the bottom and then having two small nymphs with a uh, with the you know the regular regular mm -hmm. bit. So at that point, it was changing, and then the euro nymphing and actually we call it french nymphing yeah. became a thing uh, but the, in your when you're starting out you mentioned you had success with your first red tag on a yeah, dry fly yeah. and, and and how did it sort of go from there how did you end up in the in the competition scene that was pretty pretty fast process in a short time because then I had some contacts in the shops where I spent a lot of time and of course if you're in a shop and in the circle of these people which was also computers, uh, compete, computers then yeah I just get different information at that time when I was young I had to go always on the river with somebody who was 18 or older because mm -hmm. those those are uh, public rivers mm -hmm. and there's a different rule so I had one elder uncle which was always taking me with him and that was completely old school just a fly line he was not using the nymphs at the time. He was not using the dry flies. It was basically the wet flies, mm -hmm. you know. And he was even telling me that when the fish were showing up, that was like just for no reason. It was uh -huh. not even rising fish, you know, the graylings and browns. And then I had the different information from the shops, and I was trying dead things, and it was really successful, you know, in that river. So then I just start coming more in these groups of the people which was competing. And at that point, it was very exciting for me when I got the first letter that they nominate me for the world championships, you know, as 14 oh, years old great. kid. That was like so excited going to the U.S. at that point. It was where, really. where did you fish in the U.S.? It was in Pennsylvania. Okay. I don't remember much. I remember there was like Little Juneta. I meet a few people from the Pennsylvania. And when I was mentioning these rivers, that they know, yeah, these places, it was. But there's most, uh, most people in, in uh, Eastern Europe when you're, when you're fishing, is it all sort of leaning because you mentioned your older uncle who just likes to swing his wet flies yeah, and yeah, catch yeah. the odd fish or is the scene very competitive oriented what's that uh, would you say most people are fishing to compete or to become better to eventually compete or or just to fish to enjoy that's i, I wouldn't compare because like at that point like these guys which was just on the river and trying to enjoy the time out there they really they didn't care about the competing mm -hmm. and it's like i it's something such different things Especially when you are in a in a in this competition, then you are really kind of almost not enjoying. You can have a like pleasure time over there, but you are really trying to get most of it. And especially some people are really really in the competing, and it's not fishing. No, I would say it's it's something different. Like it's in at this this point, when I know how how the fishing is, when you relax and you're just there, compared to the time when I was really competing, mm -hmm. that's I wouldn't do that any, anymore. No. I would find it very... It might be fun. If you go to the, some competition they are making and you just register yourself, just go for fun with the friends and just, you know, have a, you can have a good time, but mm. you cannot take it too serious. That's and it's just an saying. honor system. You yeah, just yeah, yeah, your own yeah. Fish. It's also nice to, you know, compare yourself with other people mm -hmm. on the s same river. But, yeah. And also, I mean, if you look at the... 
like in America, the comp- competitive scene there, they know because they stock the river so heavily. They know this stretch of river has 5,000 fish. So it's They're doing it also in Europe. Usually before the competition, they are stocking more fish. So uh-huh. actually the people are going to be fishing. It's not just about the not of Yeah, it's not just about the not of fish. That's why also it's... Even if you divide the river, not every bit going to be the same, you know. Mm-hmm. And some of the pools might be holding more fish, which they're going to be stocking. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take it too serious. Like if you want to competing or somebody competing, just take it on a on a level that you want to also enjoy fishing in a little bit different way than you going just with mm-hmm. yourself, you know. So, uh, how come? I mean, you're you're in the national team for fishing. You fished quite a lot, of, obviously, in Slovakia and around Europe with that. How come you ended up in, in Iceland? Well, I, I moved here in 2014. I'm going to be honest. Like, at that point, I was uh, fish farming in Slovakia. So I was mm-hmm. producing the rainbow trout, but I have nothing with the, with, the, with the fishing. It was just my job. And it was like a self-employer work where I uh, was producing these uh, rainbow trout. And... I was kind of young, I was 21, and at that point, like, you became fat of the of the work that you have to be there 24-7 mm-hmm. all the week. It's a live animal, you cannot turn it off, and there were just two of us, so at that point, I kind of stopped with the job, and I was looking for some, you know, to go somewhere. There was nothing holding yeah, me back there. Something interesting to do. Yeah, and on Monday, I didn't know that on Thursday I'm going to be flying to Iceland, and if I should <laughs> be honest, if you ask me where is Iceland on, on the blind map, I might to point on Greenland or something, you know. I was really not sure where I'm going. I, so and then on the end of the week, I end up on Iceland. So when you decided to come here, you had no idea that Iceland was sort of a I fishing didn't know mecca. I didn't, no, I didn't know there's volcanoes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you end up in Husavik. Were you working in fish farming there? Or? No, I end up in a, in a fish factory in Husavik together mm-hmm. with my friend, which was also a fisherman. And we were actually making some trips in Slovakia. Uh, before we made the trip here to the Iceland. And then we end up there, yeah. And I remember first time when we just get here, we even fly from Reykjavik to the Husavik. And we saw all the rivers, all the lakes, and it was just like, wow, this is crazy. It's amazing, you know, so, ma- so many waters. So yeah. we were so excited about that at the first point. And and how did you sort of get into fishing? I mean, obviously fishing is very regulated and private in Iceland. or yeah. Well, we didn't know that at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had that feeling. Yeah, so we actually were just like trying to get some information. We, uh, we we tried to go to the harbor, but then I remember we went for first fishing with my friend. It was just one of the first days after we arrived. We, of course, take our fire rods and everything. And we hitchhiked to one of the creeks we saw on the way there to the Husavik. Mm-hmm. We stopped by the river and start fishing, basically. And um, yeah. And any success there? Yeah, actually, my first first fish from Iceland was really nice brown trout. When I hooked it up, my friend was fishing a little over below me, and I, I told him that oh, I have a nice fish, and he was like, "Yeah, all fish are he- nice here." I was mm-hmm. like, "Dude, but that's a really nice one." And I ended up like fighting him for 15 minutes. I have even the pictures from that point, and we landed it on an nymph, and it was like 70 plus centimeter brown trout that was my very first fish in Iceland and what an introduction you know coming from sort of Europe where s- s- such a trout is is sort of well we have a, we have a brown trout like that's what I was always fishing but when I saw that fish I was like that's nothing what I can compare to the no to the like, Europe no it was a really huge fish at that point so you realized you had sort of landed in paradise or? yeah yeah I remember <laughs> that day to, until today it was amazing and I mean the rivers there are obviously beautiful you're, yeah it was Husavik is sort of if you take one hour around Husavik in yep. a car, you have yep. it's beautiful incredible. Area. I love the north; it's a really beautiful area. Yeah, I mean you have such an incredible uh, variety of beautiful trout water. Yeah, yep. it was everything beautiful until we figure out actual how the system work in Iceland with the fishing. Yeah, so you have to actually buy a license yep. and book your day. <laughs> 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 Everything was beautiful until then. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I remember the first time when I was looking up on some prices in Iceland, and then I kind of, my first thought was like, I want to go fishing there. I want to buy a permission, not the whole river. Mm-hmm. You know, the price was like such big, like I didn't yeah. even consider that the real price for the for the day fishing on some of the rivers. Uh-huh. It was completely new. I didn't know the system back in, back in Slovakia or most of the, yeah, in Europe. The rivers are public so even if you own the land you're not owning the river mm-hmm. and you're buying the permissions which 
cost compared to Iceland just like very little, you know. Yeah, you get like a annual permission. Yeah, yeah, something. for a year for certain areas. Okay, so I mean, I think most people know you from your adventures around Kirkjubæjarklaustur, chasing after sea trout. Yep. So, I mean, you obviously started in Húsavík, but how did you end up in, in Kirkjubæjarklaustur? It's basically different corners of the country. Yep, and in between, I went to Vancouver Island, to Canada for one ah, year. Ah, okay. So actually from Húsavík, I, 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 I moved to the to the Vancouver, Vancouver Island, to the Canada, for working holiday visa, where I also fish and stay there for almost a year. And after that, I came back to the Europe, and then I end up in a Husavik. Oh, uh, sorry, in a Kirkjubal cluster. How was fishing in Vancouver Island? That's sort of a global fishing destination as at well. At that point, it was it was very nice because then you had just new species, new new different you know rivers, different environment, lot of lot of forest, which is completely mm -hmm. different to the Iceland, where I stayed for two years in Husavik, and then different salmon species over the different time of the year was very exciting for me. I immediately jump in a in a good group of the people which show me everything. They they give me some advices where to go at what time of the year and I just fish for all the five species of the salmon there. Nice. That was very, very exciting. Do they get steelhead runs up there? There was a steelhead run but again when I went to the Canada I didn't make a research or something. The steelhead was not a big thing for me at mm -hmm. that point. I, I would maybe focus a little more on that thing now even though on Vancouver Island, there is a uh, steelhead run, but most of the people are focusing on the mi uh, mainland of the uh, British Columbia uh, for a steelhead. How uh, would you say sort of this? Because, I mean, Icelandic people, we know that Atlantic salmon is sort of considered the king of fish, yep. but then you obviously have these other salmon species. How would you say they compare? I mean, we have sort of this perception of maybe, you know, Pacific salmon is not as much a sport fish as the Atlantic salmon. Or well, because it's coming maybe with the numbers. The Atlantic yeah. salmon, it's kind of, you know, you appreciate every salmon. Like in Iceland, you have quite big um, uh, amount of the salmon. It's more about like quantity. The, 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 the amount of the salmon is, is big here. Like you mm -hmm. have a big run. Back compared to Norway or Sweden, there's much less yeah. run of the Atlantic salmon. So people kind of, I think, appreciate it more. But... For me, Pacific salmon, maybe because it was a new thing for me, I really enjoy it. Of course, I had species which was kind of, let's say, better for me. I like to focus more on, a, for example, the king salmon, of course, because of the mm -hmm. size. And the coho was definitely also something, might be my my most favorite uh, Pacific yeah. salmon, the coho. And you would say it's interesting fishing, something people should look into doing? Or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think I want to go back to the British Columbia, but I know they have a problem with the runs now. Mm -hmm. On the mainland, uh, Skinner River having like yeah. the dropping numbers of the of the fish returning back. And also this year in Vancouver Island, the government completely stops fishing in fresh water because of the water levels. So it was quite a sad situation. Yeah. Um, but definitely something... Just the nature and everything, the, the fishing is really nice. You swing the flies for the salmon, it's exciting and they're fighting very well. And then you end up in Kirchberg Cluster in by accident 2017. Yeah, also just like without, yeah, I just get the, the job opportunity and I get there. And I remember also I was just fishing, I didn't know the area, I have nobody who, who can tell me the the places, rivers it's are very uh, different to yeah. Husavik area, which is very fertile it, and, and yeah. brownies and yeah. resident fish. And, yeah. and then I end up here and I remember I was fishing some yeah. lakes that my uh, uh, employer allowed me to fish in. You know, it was on a uh, private ar uh, private uh, land. So I fished for, they were telling me there are small brown trout, but I was still f catching like 45, 50 centimeter brown trout there, which mm -hmm. was very exciting for me. And I remember they told me, like, in a river, that means Kafta, there is a big trout over there. But I just look at that river and, like, I didn't know there is a sea trout, you know. Yeah. I didn't catch them in a, uh, in a, in Husavik, so I, I, I didn't know there is a sea trout in Iceland, actually. And then I remember I first time went to Asgarde and I was casting. And the first fish was, like, 75 centimeter uh, sea trout. I break a rod on that fish. I, yeah. I landed, and when I landed, I was like, okay, that means this thing. And since that, 
since first fish I got on the first day, that sea trout, I was like, oh, yeah, this is a thing that's that's completely mental. Yeah, so you're you're arriving in 2017. You're discovering that there is sea trout in sea trout, yeah. and 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 this is sort of when the the sea trout population is also starting to go up and. And maybe not many people fishing, except for maybe the, sort of the hot spots already known. Yep. And, uh, have you done a lot of scouting of the of the Skafta, which of course has its own run? Well, yeah. after that, I make, of course, I I get new, more people, more farmers, more places, and I just make a lot of walk. I didn't have information about non rivers. I didn't know the name, so I basically I just like use the Google Maps, and it was a it was the time invested in all the places that I walk, fish, and yeah, discovered, you know, because like you can go to the different canyons in the different time of the year and you just see the nice pools in the summer that I walk and there was nothing. And then I I go in the fall and there was a full of fish. So even mm -hmm. the same rivers, I had to go two, three times and figure out where the fish are. And then I just yeah. like, I think discover kind of a lot of places around the Kirkubel cluster. And then I figure out that is one of the best spot in Iceland for sea trout, actually. And of course, uh, people, a lot of people follow you on on Instagram, and they see you with a big trout, but they don't necessarily realize how many times you had to go without catching anything, or how many this kilometers you have to Instagram, walk. This is Instagram, of course. It's showing you the best thing that that I'm gonna posting some stories, and you're gonna click on that ten seconds. That means maybe two days fishing for me, you know, uh -huh. or maybe one day fishing, and it's like five clicks for you. It's mm -hmm. so much time invested on the river, casting, walking, getting stuck in the sand and just like discovering, of course, being skunk without any bite. The, the fish on Instagram doesn't show the reality. It, mm -hmm. Of course, it's not coming easy. You need to invest the time and kind of find the fish. Yeah, it, often, it, it gives a very sort of false feel of, of catching a lot of fish. It, well, it shouldn't be about uh, catching a lot of fish. It should be showing you that this is possibility to get here. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not going to happen to everyone, but you need to kind of, the main thing to catch big fish, you need to be on a place where they are, you know? Mm -hmm. So of course, if you come there, you need to put some effort, you need to, you know, make some knowledge and go know where to go at the what time of the year and stuff like that. And then you might be able to get one of these fish. Yeah. Of course, it's not automatically going to come here and the fish going to jump in your hands. No, of course, you can, you can sort of, buy yourself a ticket to, to Tungufljot or Geilandsá or, or Tungulækur or those are big, big name rivers. Yep. But uh, what is interesting is that these glacial rivers, which are maybe not so heavily developed as a product for fishermen, you can actually go and maybe talk to a farmer and put in some work, a lot of work, I assume, and maybe catch a dinosaur. Yep, it might be possible. I mean, I think... Skaftar Herpur and this Kirkuba cluster, the sea trout there are mainly because of these glacier rivers, the Skafta and, and Kudafljot, which is flowing there. And that these have the branches of the clear water where the fish coming to spawn. So these, these glacier rivers are the most important for this whole system. And then you have all these rivers within this area where the fish are running up over, mm -hmm. the, over the fall for spawning. But yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because, uh, I mean, you've... Most Icelanders have for decades fished for uh, sea trout using single hand rod and a floating line with a sink tip and a big big streamer. I see you use uh, quite a lot of double hand rods covering a lot of water. Yeah, um, well with a single hand rod you kind of need to work hard to cast every time, especially in the wind. And if you want a streamer fishing, then uh, with double hand rod of course, if you know the technique, it's much easier for you to put the fly out there. and. It's just, I start with double hand rods in Canada, then just completely jump on the double hand rods like in mm -hmm. the Kirkuba Castle when I start fishing for sea trout. And since that, I think it's much better way of the fishing. And I see also you just use a proper double hand rod, 13, 14 feet. 15 line, feet, yeah. 15 feet yeah. even. Yeah. Which is maybe not the best for some some uh, some condition, especially when it's windy. But for me, it works, you know. And also when you're fighting the fish, that's the thing when when you want you want to have a big fish on a on a one or one of these rods, then you really can trust the rod. You can put a lot of pressure in it. It's mm -hmm. easier for you to fight. I'm not enjoying the fight that much with a fish. For me, the bite is the best thing Agreed. about the fishing. But then, 
just with the lifting rod and putting it down, you're covering like two meters of the line. So even with if the fish jump up and start running, you can put the rod up or down and you just like breaking the fish. It's mm -hmm. better for the actual fighting of the fish. Agreed. And, and also, I mean, a lot of, I think top land fishing in Iceland is coming along a little bit, but it's definitely should, I mean, we should pay more attention to it. But uh, all of it is sort of centered around fishing small flies, floating lines for salmon in clear water. Yep. And so you see a lot of 11, 6 switches, uh, 12 yep. footers, 12, 6. And it's sort of, oh, you're using this huge rod. I mean, we're fishing skaftau. Yep. You're fishing a, a fly such as the ones in front of you yep. on a heavy liter, no, sort of heavy sink tip. Why not just use the tool that's made to do it, some some 14 footer or, or something? I tried. For me, it worked very well. This uh, I also I try also. I have a switch rods which are good for for smaller rivers where mm -hmm. also when once you have a fish on it, it just better for fighting this fish. And the big rods on such a place as the Skafta and the Vatnamot where the actual river is wide, 1.8 kilometer wide, yeah. and you really have a lot of space behind you, you have, you are not limited with any casting, mm -hmm. then of course it's much better to have it on one of these big rods. And you say the river is 1.8 kilometer wide. At that point where... And where there is no sort of constant structure, there's no rock no, or, a, no. or, a, or a, a break Th that's or... A, that, that's a different cur current. You just need to cover the water and find yep. pockets yep. in the sand and yep, stuff. Yep, exactly, that's what you're looking for there. there you, you're looking for the different currents which making the reach in water where the fish are standing, you always, yeah. Uh, do you feel like, uh, because Vatnamot is your fish in clear water where it meets the colored water, uh, do you feel like more of the fish like to stay like during the day in the glacial water and yeah. like try to fish that rather than the clear water? It depends also if they're running or it's a stable weather when they're just hanging in some of the pools. And uh, sometimes definitely over the sunny, there is not such a thing. They are coming from the ocean where they not don't have a trees, rocks, so they don't necessarily need to be covered under something like a brown trout, like under the under mm -hmm. the bank or something. Yeah. But the, the, the glacier water, I can see them, especially over the sunny days, they, they are more standing in this glacier water mm -hmm. where they might be maybe feeling a little bit better protected from the, from the, from the air, mm -hmm. from the top. So yeah, definitely. They, I think they're using the glacier water as their main, main road running up so also when they're coming down, they like to hang on this meeting of the yeah. of the glacier and clear water. Yeah. And definitely on the big rivers like this, the best thing is find the two currents meeting. Yeah. That's that's the thing. That's the only thing what you're looking for on such a big place. Because like when you're coming to the to the to the Vatnamot, let's say, mm -hmm. that's like that's like lake. You know, you, you can, almost cannot see the uh, the other side. But once you have a look at it and walk through it. You're gonna find these small pockets, and you're gonna figure out where the fish are standing. Or, well, that's always this two currents meeting, where it's slow water, where the fish can be just standing and hanging next to the fast water current. Yeah, but like, because I've spent some time there now, guiding and fishing, and often through the good clear days, bright sunny yep. light, and like you can see a lot of fish just head and tailing and stuff in the glacier. Yep. Have you had any good success catching them in the colored water? In the color water. Yeah, just Definitely. in pure... They can see that fly. Yeah, oh yeah. You know, and... Uh, but I'm just wondering about if our listeners that are going fishing there or have similar areas, uh, what are your techniques on catching fish in the extremely colored water? Like, in the color water, technically, the, the black fly in the dark water should be the most contrast one. So I like to use the black flies, but it happened a lot of time that over the sunny days where the, the weather was bad for fishing then the white flies works very well. And actually, over the sunny days, small presentation with a floating line or slow intermediate line work very good, just like for swing, not even making like any stripping. Oh, exactly. That's when the fish, like, it just get irritated and they bite it. Mm -hmm. Back when it's the bad weather, rough condition, rain, uh, wind, strong wind, then you can go with a little faster sinking tip and then you can start stripping, you can go more aggressively on, on the fish and they're willing to take it. Mm -hmm. So bad weather is actually for the for faster presentation of the flies, I would say. I remember as a kid, uh, friends of my parents had a, I would say just a, f a farm there. It was used as a summer house, close to Kirchberg Cluster. 
and there was a little creek that fed into Skafto, and we're not talking a river, we're just talking a, a, a small creek. And where it meets Skafto, they would often put a little net if they needed fish just for dinner. And they would catch some very nice sea trout there. There was no, hardly a junction, you would say. And I remember catching a sea trout there just using a spoon. Um, do you, is your feeling that there's a lot of fish also that's not using the scuffed out to go anywhere? It's just they are scuffed out breed. Or they, do you think they're it, just staying I'm, in the scuffed out all the time. Yeah. I don't think so. No. It's a glacial river with very few nutrition. Mm -hmm. And the fish is lazy animal. And he wanted to just get food, you know, easy food. So for him, it's better to go to the ocean to get the nutrition over the summer because he needed it for the spawning time and, uh, and winter when they need to stay in the fresh water. Ah, yes, but I'm thinking about uh, sea trout that run up yeah. and they actually just spawn in the skafta itself. They're not going... In the skafta, yeah. definitely. Yeah. In some of the... Uh, in, a, in the pools and uh, where's the... Yeah, definitely, there's uh, spawning also in the skafta. There are some pools... That, and as you say, that there was some small creek, they, the, the, and you find fish there. I walk around the Skafta in different small creeks and just ditches. The, the sea trout running every every creek over there. Because I've seen when fishing in in, uh, in October, uh, you can see just, just unbelievable scenes of fish when they're starting to spawn. They just crawl up every spring creek. Everywhere, nets, everywhere. Backs up above yeah. water yeah. trying to spawn. Later in the season, you can find them in a in a top area in the Skafta, and like they starting of course from the bottom, but then mm -hmm. there you can find them all the way up, and definitely some of them gotta be also spawning in a, in a glacier water. So, I I'm I'm not asking you to spot burn yourself or anything like that, but would you say it's worth for someone who's willing just to put in the time to get one nice fish? to and has access or, or believe he has access to just go and fish it step by step with a with a double hand rod and a sink tip and just anywhere in Skafta? Definitely. Yeah. That over the, especially in the spring when they're coming back to the ocean, also when in the fall when they're running up, they they're going in every pool. I, I, I have information they they are almost in every slower water, deeper deeper bank or something. They're just you're gonna find them there. Mm -hmm. like I, I fish even in the glacier water in the spring, completely colored, and the fish are showing up there, and you can you can catch them almost everywhere in Skafta. But, but of course, in the spring the river is a little bit clearer because there's not yeah, so yeah, much melt. Yeah, yeah, definitely it's getting clearer. But in the autumn, you, you stop at the gas station in Kirkjuvai Cluster when yeah. you're fishing. You look at the river; it looks nice, but it's just so damn murky. It's murky, but even in that water, you can get a fish. Mm. Yeah, but definitely at that point. The, as you say, in the spring, the water is clear. And at that point, you can catch the fish in most of the pools f around Kirkjubel Cluster because that's the time when they're coming down to the to the ocean. They're schooling up. And in any better-looking uh, pool, there, there, there are fish. What do you look for? Just slower water? Always one thing, two currents meeting, fast mm -hmm. and slow current meeting with little depth where the fish can hang. And they're very often also showing them on a on a on the surface. Usually, at the, at the evening when the sun going down, that's very that's the time when the fish are becoming very active, and then they are showing up themselves. Even over the days when the conditions are not right, or over the sunny days or stable weather. I've heard some uh, crazy stories of the area sort of below Vatnamot, sort of Skafta or Holmasai. Have you fished fished that? Movabat. Sorry. Movabat. I think it's below Vatnamot. Vatnamot. I might be bad with the names, but below Vatnamot, it's like th there's a fishing cabin. Ah, yeah. Is it's it called Skafta Beat Number Two or something. I don't remember what it's called. Movabat, I think. Below Vatnamot, on the same size, but closer to the ocean, mm -hmm. like five kilometers or seven kilometers. Yeah. Yeah, I fished that. I fished that two years ago. I know uh, there's even the the fishing book. It's like very simple. But really nice, very remote cabin in the middle of nothing. And there was a book from 1980. Uh, I, I don't know exactly the uh, the year, but 1987 or something when the fish uh, people were fishing there. And my informations are that the, the skafta changing currents every 15 years from left to right. Mm -hmm. And before they used to be holding pools. Now when we fish there. We didn't almost found any any place where the fish can be standing. Even when the currents were meeting, usually the the water was very very shallow. So probably you can be lucky there. 
at the time when you're gonna catch the run and yeah. the fish gonna be running in the schools up. But at that point, I saw one fish jump. I came there on the first cast, I got the fish, and there was only fish we got in five pre- people in three days. Oof. Okay. But you you can get lucky there with the good run, but definitely what I heard that's not holding pools, and we didn't find any holding pool over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, it's so interesting now. I mean, sea trout has been on the rise. Obviously, prices have been on the rise as well. So yeah. Rivers are fetching more money. It's, you can hardly get a, a fishing license on, on some of these um, rivers most of this, anymore. My information is already booked out even for this year. Mm-hmm. So. But it's, it's uh, yeah, I mean, this, this is maybe not the most interesting part to me to talk to you about. Is, it's not the, the Eldwat, the Gelandsa, the Tungufljot. It's, it's all the other stuff that if you just are willing to put in a little bit of work that you can actually just go fishing and, and work for a trout there. There is still a lot of, I would say, undiscovered places and especially places or the rivers which are not run by kind of bigger corporates or, or I mean, the companies. Mm-hmm. There are still rivers and creeks which are in private hands and the farmers have it. And it's quite a lot of them. But some of the places, or most of the places, you need to know someone who knows someone to get there. Oh, yeah. And there are also the farmers which, for example, they don't like spring fishing and they were even offered by some good money, but they don't want to anybody fish in the springtime. And there are the rivers which the the farmers just keeping for themselves. Oh, yeah. And they don't want actually anybody fish there because like almost every creek, almost <coughs> every branch which is there connected to Skafta, and also closer to the uh, Skaftafet area, which is also, there's big river systems. All these rivers, I believe, holding really nice sea trout. And and I mean, some of these clear creeks, like you mentioned them and stuff, it's not, they're maybe not so fun to fish. They're more spawning grounds. So, they, so if you fish them, you would kind of clean them out. Higher areas, definitely. I understand also the point of the farmers which I appreciate a lot that they're putting the respect for the nature about the money and they like so they like s- their land so much they don't want to actually ruin these mm-hmm. populations even if they don't fish for it they like to have these rivers there untouched and definitely high uh, higher places on these river systems are very very important for next populations it's just it's so intriguing i, I wish i had had some more time to explore but uh, and then now we've been seeing because with the rise of sort of fly only and and catch and release, yep. we've been seeing just the size. Because if you look at old fishing videos from people going to Skaftavel Sea Sly and fishing, they're I mean, they mean they're not catching maybe unnecessarily great numbers. Yep. There will always be these stories of people hitting the run in Vatnamot and just cleaning out two hundred fish in two days and. And all that, and then you see them catch a big fish, what they consider to be a big fish, what looks on the video to be like a 10, 12 pounder. And you've been catching, and I mean, we've all been catching, but especially you, you've been running across a lot of 90 plus centimeter fish. Have you noticed that they are getting bigger and more of them are getting bigger? I think for me, just such a short time fishing here that uh, I can be comparing the, what was like five years ago because I am fairly new in this thing. But by the informations and like my opinion, of course, catch and release will produce bigger fish. The, the, the sea trout by the research is long, long, uh, long-term long living trout, which can live up to 18, 19 years. So mm-hmm. basically if somebody was taking the fish, it can be killing like 15 years of fish, which, which I think it's crazy. And yeah, of course in the future, the people gonna be probably starting catching bigger and bigger fish. With with this area, it became like catch and release just recently. I think it's just gonna increase in the next year. I and my opinion, even a couple of years back, was that the sea trout are the future of Iceland. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely, it's just it's yeah, it's it's interesting to see that three years ago maybe when I really started going there quite a lot. You know, a 90 centimeter fish was a huge, huge, huge fish just three years ago. Even last, you know, 2021 in Tungufljot, you know, it was a rarity. Somebody got a 90 centimeter, it was, you know, almost on the news. Yeah. And now it's sort of moved to 95. Yeah. And then 
over the hundred limit. I think we're gonna get there in a couple of years now because like if you're not gonna kill that fish, it's gonna grow. They're gonna yeah. they're gonna they might be dying. It's very the old old all fishermen, I, I mean, like all side fishermen, they really think that after you catching the fish, it's gonna die anyway. So that's why they was like um, excuses they they killing. But it's also about like how you how you handle the fish after 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 catching dry hands and keeping the fish in the water. That's like basic. Like I mm -hmm. think most of the fishermen know now. But once you release that fish, it's just gonna just of course grow bigger. And I believe it's gonna increase also in average sizes in all these areas. Yeah. And also my 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 theory, what we're trying to prove now with the uh, with the tugging the fish, is that the sea trout not necessarily like a salmon running the same uh, river mm -hmm. as as a salmon. I think they are mixing in a groups at the at the year, and they're kind of running the of course the same area, but they might be running different rivers in the same area over the different years. Ah. So even if you are protecting one river in a lower section and then you have a catch and kill in a top section, it might be affecting also the different rivers which have a catch and release for, for, for years. Mm -hmm. So, But now, once most of the rivers there became a catch and release, I think just it's going to show in, a, in the next years. Yeah, I think it's very exciting. We've been tagging a lot of fish in Vatnamot. I can't wait to catch one of these food yeah. just to see how they how they're growing over the year and especially if we're going to catch them also in a different if different section of our different river as we uh, catch them and tag them first time. And will you be catching them, you know, will you be catching fish from Vatnamot and Eltuat? That would be exciting. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That would be exciting to see. And of course, it's a slow process because like you cannot tag them all. And mm -hmm. of course, it's going to show up just after a couple of years. But that's also the nice thing about that. It's uh, like small work. Is of course the most interesting place to tackle them in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, that's that's a place where three or four rivers meeting together. So mm -hmm. that's basically where where this dividing to the different river systems. Yeah. So that's like they are concentrated in that area. And I would not be surprised if we would catch a fish in Tunguflot. It was caught or tagged in Vatnamot because the, it's the same river. It's the same river. Kulafljot and Skafta. Yep. It's yep. the same water. Yep. But it's interesting because we've been Birk Birkir fish now a couple of times, and uh, which obviously now has become catch and release. But in the past has been quite heavily also in the spring, fish killed there and and all that. Of of course that river has huge fish and maybe has. I mean, it has unlimited potential because even with all the killing, we we definitely see fish there around the meter mark, but. Uh, my feeling is having fished always Gelandsau and then going straight to Tungufljot is the fish are a little bit smaller on average in Gelandsau. So the, it's, yep. it's, it's behind. I think it will probably catch up, but it's interesting. Because the Tungufljot is catch and release for a couple of years now. Yeah. And that might be showing the difference already. Yeah, Because exactly. there's in, a, in, a, in the Kudafljot branch, there's not so many. There, there was Eldvat on the bottom and there is a Tungufljot. There, there is not any other river which... Basically, they uh, targeting on a sea trout, and there was a catch and kill. Mm -hmm. So I think the the Gerlanza and Fosalar and all these areas, mm -hmm. they're just going to come up the same way, maybe even faster. I think the population in this right side of the of the Skafta might be even bigger than on a on a Kuda mm -hmm. area. Yeah, I, I, you see, you catch a lot of fish around that 70 centimeter mark in in Gerlanza. and in. My feeling is that these normal fish you catch on the Gelanzo at 70, they are sort of become 80 in Tungufljot. Sh yeah, and, they, and they're growing so fast in the ocean. <laughs> yeah. They have so much nutrition. They are just fedding up. So they're fe uh, growing fast, and this 70 to 80 might be very, very fast, uh, fast process. And then 80 to 90, of course, they're not going to be catching just 110 centimeters in five years. No. But it might be possibility. It's like an Instagram. They, you need to be first on the area where these fish actually live, exist, you know, and then we might be able to be catching fish like this. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say it's going to be on a daily basis, but it might be possibly to, to, that this is going to happen. And I believe it's going to happen, you know. Yeah, as long as conditions in the ocean remain favorable. Well, that's something we cannot always, we you know, that. change. No. But yeah, if everything go in a good way, then yeah. But it is... It is so incredible to be fishing these places now and, you know, a 10-pound trout, which everywhere in the world is a trophy, yep. and they're in such quantities that you, I, I'm ashamed to say, you, you hardly stop to take a picture anymore because they are... 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, basically, I mean, also in Vatna mode, if you are waist deep and you're having this like 75, 80, if you are able to land it just yeah. in the hands, you just like release it back and go go for another one. It's, we shouldn't be spoiled with this one. We should appreciate not even big fish. It's not only about the size. No. But yeah. It's incredible if you think about it. I mean, I mean I've mean, i been to Argentina to chase for sea trots and, and uh, of course you see there very large sea trot jumping and of course it's a fantastic place but I think what we have here compares in, in every level and probably sort of the quality of water is, is way more here. I always have few questions about Argentina. I've never been there, so I cannot like compare it. But with somebody who was there, how mm. how would you compare these two places? Because other than this, Iceland sea trout are native to this area. Other than that, yeah. you you don't have that many river options in Argentina. No. Basically, fishing two rivers for for trophy sea trout. Mm -hmm. And here in Iceland, you can just choose from the glacier rivers to big streams, creeks, lakes, all with the sea trout. Like for me, yeah. there is no question about the. The Mac Single land, job. double land, nymphing, streamers, uh, whatever fly on a good day. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's it's crazy quality, and also it it's sort of a different feel to the fish. The, the Argentina fish they have much shorter lifespans. They grow faster. Yep. You see, they're very thick, yep. but they're short, and their heads are small and their tails are small. Yep. Uh, the biggest sea trout I've I've caught I got in Tungufljot uh, 2021, and you know, 95 centimeter male, it has this big, big hat. hat. That's, a, that's the best It part. has the scars on the belly. Yeah, the, the, the the bottom of the tail is all worn out. Yeah, it tells yeah. a story that it's spawned many yeah. times. And it's, yeah, it's... Spawning marks and everything. It's got character. The, the, absolutely. The, the the profile of the fish, the hat and everything, this, what you mentioned, it's just the, the most beautiful part of this sea trout here. The quality mm -hmm. of them, the, the size, and they're amazing. I, I, I have no doubts about the, the sea trout maker. Yeah. And I mean, I, I fished, you know, I obviously I'd fished a little bit out east, but for many years, I mean, just a small river like Varma was sort of my, my go-to for for sea trout, and you're not going to get many, you know, 90 plus, you know, yeah. I, I've only caught them up to 85, and, and I've heard of bigger fish, but I think people around me, which for a while we used to, sort of obsessively fish this river. And I think there seems to be some sort of a barrier at 85, how big they can yeah, get. Yeah. But then you're fishing for 85 centimeter trouts the same way you would be fishing in Slovenia for 30 centimeter trouts. On your, on your knees, nymphing with yeah, a yeah, yeah. four or five weight. It's, it's, I mean, it's mind-blowing. You went to Varmo for the first time last year? or Yeah. And like, how yeah. did you like it compared to everything you do out east? You can compare it. <laughs> it's yeah. different. It's different river system, kind of. There's like a lot of this, uh, the the brown trout, the juvenile, juvenile size. Oh. Yeah, it's very but, fertile. Yeah, but also the pools. Those not. It's it's a small creek. Mm -hmm. Of course, it holds nice fish. I was guiding there last year, first time on a on on one day we got I think fourteen fish. I don't remember exactly all from 50 to 80 centimeters it was completely different it was kind of nuts we were not uh, fishing them with a with a nymphing style and these fish are running down a lot they have just one way yeah. down or up so mm -hmm. you just basically jogging after them it's completely different i wouldn't even like compare it to s any of the rivers around Skaf Skaftar Herbora. it's more sort of traditional uh, trout fishing but the fish are just bigger yeah, yeah, definitely. And the, the technique you're using there for swinging the fly, the streamer, also the nymphing technique with the indicator. Let's say it, I, I prefer indicator fishing much better than Euro nymphing. Mm -hmm. That feeling with the fly line, I, it might be because of that, uh, the competing, which mm -hmm. I have in the past. I kind of completely stopped with the, with the Euro nymphing. Uh, two years back, I had to uh, tie the whole new box of the nymphs because I completely stopped using the nymphs. Mm -hmm. And I was like a if I see the the trout raising for dries, I would still throw a streamer on him. Yeah. It just for me, it was just yeah. that we, obsession we go of the day. Faces, yeah, definitely. Know. But now I just get back. I can appreciate also fishing, especially like over the bad condition days, which mean like sunny, stable weather when the fish are really not willing to move. You kind of need to bring that fly right in front of the face when if they like it, they're going to bite it and they don't have to chase it necessarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Varmo, when you have water, because it fluctuates quite a quite a bit, yeah. 
just fishing a, a floating line and a plastic sun ray or something, it's exceptional. But a lot of times when it's low water, you just have to be on your knees. Yeah, yeah definitely. That's but that's in most of the places. I think the people should figure out once the fish see you, it's behave differently. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be more more careful and stuff like that. So yeah, definitely. Even on big rivers, don't get too close to the fish if you see the school and just start fishing even if you're not casting right on the fish start from the side and make a step make a step cast step cast step and always searching for me the Vatna Modari might be one of the my most favorite places mm -hmm. because it's such a big area and for me the game there it's not the catching it's finding the fish where they're standing once I find them I don't I don't even have to cast there I'm happy to, that I found them mm -hmm. that's, that's a game for me there to find the fish interesting yeah uh, it's yeah. It's always a it, it's always a niche. I mean, in the beginning, you like the fighting of the fish, then it's the take, and then it's just for yeah. For me, the take like in a in a different area, but for me, always it's a take, mm -hmm. which is the best part of the fishing, the take, and then releasing the fish. That's what I'm enjoying. Yeah, I went through a, a little bit of a euro nymphing obsession, like 2015 or something. Uh, Modern nymphing, you know, I saw that and and really got into it for a, for a little bit, and then I just said I like to cast a fly line. Definitely, the feeling is different, and I can see it. Like everybody probably went or will go through the urine nymphing. They either like it. I I have nothing against it. If you like it, enjoy it. It's just my opinion that I'm not enjoying that much. The feeling with the line, it's just completely different, and I can see it sometimes on my customers. There are big urine emperors and stuff like that coming, and then we have a rising trout, and it's problem to cast a fly on eight meters with the dry fly. Uh, I think it's more. It's, I mean, it is fly fishing, but it's more to do with, for me at least, it has more to do with just catching fish than just Definite, it's, fishing. It's, it's you know? effectivity of that thing. You know, you're bringing the small bites in front of the face, which the fish doesn't even need to be hungry or willing to take that they, they might have that um, passive phase of the day and they're just willing to take it because it's right there you know but it's good to sometimes save your ass absolutely <laughs> that, that, that's, that's why i start with the nymphing because once you're guiding you need to the people don't care that it's like not good weather for streamer they want to catch fish so you, you mm -hmm. need to like use the technique which is going to be producing even and on even, the days you know, you've paid a lot of money for your days and absolutely like, or something yeah, yeah. it's low water and you want to catch fish you know yeah and just you're going to put the fish down or spook them with a big streamer and a yeah, sink yeah. tip and that might happen yeah. yeah it's it's interesting i'm i'm because uh, i haven't fished so much these sort of i haven't fished vatna mode and i i fished you know sidri holme and and flowbacker and I mean, flugbakar, for example, in May, when there's not there's nothing stopping the fish from going down. Yep. And there is not really a pool there. It's there's very little structure. You you cast your line out. You even feel it sort of skipping on the sand. It's not even deep. But all of a sudden, just boom, yep. eighty plus centimeter sea trout. Uh -huh. Why? There must be so much fish if they decide Ever to be there. The that's what I'm saying. That in most of the pools, in, on the way down, they're gonna be stopping on small, small pockets. It doesn't necessarily be need to name pool, no. and that's a thing where you can discover a lot of places. Just if if the water level allows you to go to these places, it's always worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there might be less people fishing before. There might be less stress for the fish, and they might be just rested there, and they would be willing to take your fly even on the first cast. But I also noticed what what must be. Part of your kick, uh, you talk about finding the fish in water mode, is I go to Flöbakar, I wait into the middle, and I fish every hand all the way down. Nice. I come, uh, I'm, I was there in April, I come again two weeks later in May, I try to wait into the middle, yeah. and all of a sudden it's, it's way too deep. And it's mm -hmm. not that the water level has changed so much. It's just the sand has moved. Moving. That's a that's a nice thing. Also, the water mode pulls they can change almost over the night. It's, if, all, if it's the water irritating also, no, I <laughs> but love it's it. also I love fun, it because you know, it's a challenge. The, the pools are kind of still on the same areas, but there's a different rivers, and even one river raise up, one drop down, the stand mm -hmm. is moving, and like the pool which was there a week before might not be there this time, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's also nice looking for these places. Like we had in 21, that we had this eruption in Grimsworth, which yep. created a flood, and... 
I was fishing my days in Eldvatn and all of a sudden the and also Grenlækur, the water turns murky yeah. and they're not in the same spots as they you're used to and it and you just kind of have to go and and find them find all them over again, again. Yeah. and then it goes back to normal and having Skafto go up to 600 700 cubic yeah, meters yeah. it moves the sand completely and it's just ah oh, fuck it everything I've learned is now worthless and let's go again <laughs> but that's that's a fishing you're learning all yeah, the time no, and just like you know different different even weather on the same river that's what i was saying even when i was scouting the areas and going to the one river it might be beautiful river without the fish then you need to go in a different time of the year when they're actually in that system mm -hmm. so there's also in the different areas over the floats they are going to be coming maybe closer to the banks on some rivers then when the water drop down in Vatnamo, they might be going more in the glacier water. They, they, they're moving. That's, that's what I actually like about that place. Have you fished these places a lot during just summertime? You know, July, mm. early August? Early August, like in, in Skaftar Aeropo area, in some of the years, last year, the sea trout started running very early. Like in mm. middle of Ju uh, July, the fish was already in a Yonkvist scene, you know. In Yonkvist? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That one of the first in my opinion, one of the first sea trout which is possible to fish for is in the Yonkvist. Yeah, Yonkvist, like Grenelekur, yeah, that yeah. area, this, uh, yeah, yeah. usually around the first weekend of August, yep. this was always this, considered the best time in Sekhpur, Absolutely, for because the, uh, the, the Yonkvist and Grenelekur coming like a first creek to the Skafta mm -hmm. in a river mouth of the ocean. So that's the first sea trout that's just going to be hitting in that direction. And that's the first clear water when the, f the sea trout going to be running up. Mm -hmm. And also the fish, they can... Uh, though they're early up in Grenland like and all the other spots, they're early as well in Vatnamot. They yeah, just yeah. have such a big area. You to just yeah, can't yeah. find them. They can yeah. be 300 fish in Vatnamot yeah. without you and ever In Vatnamot, we're fishing like one the top part up there. Yeah. But then in between the ocean and us, it's like such a big area and nobody actually walking there. Actually, yeah, the, the currents are a little different. Like the best area where to fish in Vatnamot is up there. But below, that's such a huge area where Needle the fish can be outside. And how many fish we're catching in the in Vatnamod area, and how many fish need to be stretched all the way to the ocean. I yeah. think that's a great number. Man, I just want to go and, and, and walk Kuda Fljot <laughs> and all these places with the my Kuda Fljot, I heard that they were doing the research, and by this research, they say they might be the biggest sea trout in the world living over there. Mm. Yeah. I know it's very hard wading over there with the, with this, uh, the quicksand and stuff like that, but that got to be very exciting area as well. I We had a one of those scientists here on the show, and he said, you know, I've I've caught some fish in Kula Flow during research in, in nets that you just wouldn't believe. Yep. And I mentioned well, Argentina and, and some of the 95 centimeters in, in, in Tungu Flow and stuff, and he was just smiling and shaking yep. his head. Well, actually, I would believe him, believe uh, him. Right? The area is, and not so many people fishing in that area because there is not really access mm -hmm. to these places. At least I didn't, that area I didn't kind of figure out. That uh, that uh, east side. There's plenty there of time side. left. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Some time left. <laughs> yeah. We always need to have some next thing to do. Yep. But it's also, I mean, of course, problematic. And what makes it dangerous and hard fishing these rivers is you have to wait and yep. you don't see where you're stepping and it's black sand even yep. if you see it, it is and quicksand. And have you gotten into some deep shit with the quicksand? Well, not me, but I had a, I had a. Yeah, the yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, it was last year in the spring. And they kind of get stuck, start panic, call a rescue team and stuff like that. I was kind of pissed because he gets stuck at the time when it was the like, the best time of the day when the fish start biting after all day. <laughs> the sun go down like one hour, like half hour before sunset and that time, you know, when it was getting darker. And then you have Magic to there, <laughs> stuck. <laughs> freaking out that he's getting <laughs> caught stuck with the leg down right and in front of the car or something no we were kind of far we actually i don't was remember it? we need to bring the shovel but yeah there was i think was it three out or from four. out from fossilar junction it, no it was in a about the bucky okay okay about the bucky and then we need to yeah dig him out and, and <laughs> take uh, him yeah. home. well uh, like i feel for Pierki, like it's not fun yeah, no, no I'm, I'm not. I'm stuck not, in this. I'm, 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 not, I'm not laughing on that. It might be terrifying, especially one time it happened to me with a customer from Germany. And <laughs> that was scary to see because, like, he was walking right after me. And he, I was watching him. He made one step and he was completely stuck. Yeah. And just like there's this 
sand without no pressure before the drop. So it's kind mm -hmm. of fluffy. And mm -hmm. once you step in it, it just closes itself. And both of these guys were telling me that they have a lot of uh, pressure around the ankle and they cannot really move it. Yeah. And at that point, luckily, there was another group of guys fishing below us and they bring us the, the shovel as well to dig him out. I was just like calming the guys. That's everything fine. Like luckily, there is no water level rising up or going down. So if you stay calm, you're gonna get if you have a help it's not good to fish these areas alone and also it's good to remember don't try to pull your leg very hard out straight up because it's very un unnatural movement for your knee so yeah. you might dislocate your knee and make even more damage so just stay calm and hopefully somebody else can help you out from the sand. yeah I, I have once had an incident in Eldwat where I where I was about to get completely stuck in, in sand and and I sort of had this big sturdy salmon net and I stuck it down and was it sort of able to yeah. create some room to pull up pull my leg out and I just dived into the river and then swam ashore and then this net was standing there from the sand uh, so a friend of mine waited out wanted the salmon net back we never got the net out he ended up breaking wow. the shaft of the net because the sand was so sucked so much pressure it just on sucks it, yeah. around the net and you just and it's kind of I would say dangerous one of these rivers with the black sand and the clear water you not always can estimate the depth and everything and also it happened to me I was fishing Eldvat uh, about the old farm mm -hmm. and there was a nice nice island and I want to just go over it and jump over it and my friend was telling me like it's too deep you cannot get there and I was like, I can see the water, like, it's not that deep, you know, like, I, I'm fishing for long. I made one step and I was like knee, knee, knee deep in water, start swimming, throwing my fly boxes out on, a, on the water. It was, <laughs> it was one step and uh, I was completely like swimming in Eldvat. Eldvat is one of the creepier rivers to wait in. It's, it's an amazing river. It's like, you, always you kind of need to, need to figure out the place. Yeah, uh, it's this, I think people that ski, and I've sort of experienced whiteouts can sort of relate, but it's the complete opposite because the water is gin clear yeah. and the bottom is completely black. Uh, yeah. So you don't realize, and, the, and it's such a young river, it hasn't sort of scraped its bottom, so it's just lava yeah. and you have all these pockets and pools. And Different structures and everything. Yeah. So one step and you're stepping into a hole or a cave. Into and nothing and you're swimming. <laughs> No river where I've scraped my hands yep. Yep. so many times from just falling over. Yep. Uh, it's interesting, but uh, I mean, you fished everywhere. There, you fished the Grenlækur, you fished the the Eldvatn, obviously, Tungufljót, Geirlandsá, Vatnamót. Uh, what's your favorite? What is your favorite thing to do for sea trout? Oh, I would. At the beginning, for me, the most exciting was actually lake fishing for sea trout. When there mm -hmm. was running into one lake, there was really exciting fishing with a hoover line. You're seeing the fish, especially at the beginning of the season, when you see the first movement of the sea trout in the, in the system. Mm -hmm. And then you can get closer to this fish and casting around this area when they're showing up and start stripping fast. And you saw the shape of the fish following your fly and then just set the hook and start fighting. S the the lake fishing was very exciting for me at that point but f now it might be actually the the glacier or where the clear waters meeting with the glacier water these big open areas where you kind of need to look for the fish um uh, the um uh, tunguflot definitely where it's uh, coming to the and Sidriholmi. Sidriholmi. yeah it's kind of exciting for me i mm -hmm. love that place and then vatnamot it's really really my where you have to work a little bit for it. Kind of. Like search, yeah. 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 At, the, at the first, when you come there first, you might feel lost because it's such a big area. You see no structure, nothing like the riverbank or something. You need to walk and need to figure out. But once you see the pools and everything, the, the currents meeting, and you can estimate where the fish can be standing on a on a glacier and clear water, it's it's exciting for me. Mm -hmm. I, I love Vatnamot a lot. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it in Tungvljot, but in Sidrolm, there's a big clay bank behind you. Have oh. you ever seen my markings in the clay bank? Yeah. Yeah, because like, <laughs> this day, the fish are all out from that mark. So yeah. you just make a little mark with a stick or something. Yeah. And it's always fun. Next, The next day, you walk there, and like, all right, they're 10 meters down now. Yeah. Kula float has gone a little bit off or something. But it is ridiculous, that pool, Sidrolm, 
because I think a, a lot of people have been there. It's it's been on the market for a long time. The, the Tungufljot is sort of a known size, and they can sort of take that study and just apply it to everything that you're talking about. You get there in the morning. They're very high, almost up in shallow water in Tungufljot. Then a cup. You start fishing, and they drop back, and and then they are completely into the glacier, and then they disappear. You go have a sandwich, and the sand is completely different, and the and the depth is much closer to you, and the, they're there, and it's all within one day. Yep, and that's what I say before. Like more I fish, the more I don't understand them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just like it changing constantly the thing, and also in a in a Sidri homie, sometimes the fish are all the way. Up where is the first meeting of the mm-hmm. uh, Tungufljot with the with yeah, the glacier water. And even above, above the that on the above yeah. also in the glacier water we were catching them back in a yeah. couple of years back. And then also this year, one of the first, I think it was in August, I was fishing there. That there was a water completely standing up there. Mm-hmm. But there is a small ridge mm-hmm. where the yeah. fish were just, just like going up and down. Side, and I yeah. remember I was calling with the Christian actually from Fish Partner, he was going back to the highland. And I had the just the f- the rod in my under my pit, and I finished the phone, cast the line, and uh, I saw the fish just head and tail in front of me, exactly where I cast it. And my few strips in this completely slow water, I haven't seen any fish uh, before there, and he hit it, and it was that 97 centimeter uh, feature, fresh. one of the first one. Yeah, that was Crawler. fresh, beautiful. Oh. It's crazy. And I had to walk with him actually on a rod because I cannot land him all the way out there. So I had to back up all the way to the to the to the bank on the other side with the fish. Yeah, I I've had moments there where you you know Tungufljot is coming in the Kula Fljot and you have yeah. this V sand ridge. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've you know when when the fish disappear you think oh they're in the glacier or I need to wade across and cast towards this bank and so I'm in the process of doing that. I wait over. I get to the end of this V. My thing is I'm going to cast into the bank. And actually, I could walk quite a long mm-hmm. way down. But as I'm just walking into the glacier above where they come together, yep. on just 15, 20 centimeters of water, Shallow. they're just yeah, everywhere yeah. scattering. Yeah. It's, it's just sometimes sometime also we're fishing the, the Sidri homie from the other side. When If the water mm-hmm. level is low enough, we walk mm-hmm. into the glacier water and actually casting to the bank, to the yeah, other side. That's what I, that was my thinking, but the fish were all just... But yeah. Sitting on in no water. Shallow water, yeah. Well, yeah, I had some nice fish that I it's you know the pool, so it's kind of going behind the corner. So I had mm-hmm. this year there with Auke, mm. actually one fish which dragged me all the way down that wow. I had to climb on a Yeah, on it's a dangerous. Hill and going down and I landed like two hundred meters below because actually the fish was already tired laying down but there was no place to no. to land it and I was already like five meters above the uh, the river so I had to walk down on the beach and land it there and then there was that one re- fish which get me in the um, end of the backing oh, it was yes. a very similar situation I hooked the fish a little higher up where's the uh, current meeting I fired the fish at the beginning just in the top section and I thought I'm gonna land it over there but the fish just decided to go down the river and I did the same thing go behind the corner climb up the hill Walk down, and at the point where I landed, that I think that was 92 centimeter fish before. At that point, the fish just start running all the way down, down, down behind the other corner, and my line get cut in a in a one of the of the, the grasses which is there. falling in the water, yeah. and I end up swimming in the water <laughs> trying to rip off the backing, out, <laughs> and I just seeing my reel coming like completely to the end of the backing, and then I broke off the fish. I've the seen end. many fish lost by just going down from Sidrome. And mm-hmm. it's yeah. the only place I have actually found full fly lines yeah. in the yeah. water, yeah. no fish attached. It's like, okay, yeah, I know that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> but here we, we know a couple of guys that actually went around Sirolme yeah. in total darkness, there mm-hmm. for the first time, uh, landed the beautiful fish while completely shit face. <laughs> they were there for the first time and they had no idea that the bank they were walking on, the very slippery clay yeah. edge was just, they were walking to their death. Actually, they would have just stepped one step to the, the wrong direction. Yeah. The spot you're talking about where the little trees end, where you have yeah, to yeah. climb up. Climb up, where is it? Where they is did the fence? not climb up. They didn't they just go up. follow. Yep. There is, yeah. oh, okay. There, but the, how? It's not possible. No. <laughs> There's a bank going steep down with a, this gla- uh, clay. Yeah, we, we yeah. tried to ask them how. They said, yeah, we just uh, walked. They, they don't remember. That, that's a magic. There's just <laughs> yeah. a picture of them very happy in the sand <laughs> below with a, with like a 12, 14 pounder. Oh, yeah. 
But yeah, it's uh, it's definitely one of the more interesting uh, stuff you can do in Iceland is is fishing these these places. But uh, I want to ask you also because uh, I noticed on your on your Instagram that Auke, which we know, uh, you took him on a little journey to Slovakia to fish your home waters, and you ended up catching uh, how do you say it? Huken or Huko? Huko? Danib yeah. Salmon. Yeah. Yep. Well, there was our European uh, Taiman, basically. Yeah, we call it Danib salmon, mm -hmm. which is like this is a native tra trout species, which is living in the branches of the Danib uh, Danib River. And there was uh, actually a kind of fish which we went to target, but they won't come easy. Like it's kind of a lot of effort to get one of these. It's There's a, not so many in a, in a, in the rivers, and yep. Uh, the the condition predator, was predatory the fish. predators are uh, almost only feeding on uh, on uh, other species of the fish. So they feed rarely. There is a few of them because they need a lot of area for each one, and they grow big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Usually they might be staying in a in a couple, like two fish together, mm -hmm. and they are kind of they are even like when they're hunting for uh, for the bait, they are kind of helping each other, you know, ah. like uh, running, uh, like um, chasing but the other fish. They they that's like natural behaving of them. And yeah, they are kind of predators. So in big, we call it hookah pools because they need to have like a size of that fish where they're going to be hanging when they're going to be chasing the fish. And yeah, there there need to be also a lot of like uh, different species of the fish which they are feeding on. Mm -hmm. And we're fishing in Slovakia, which actually uh, my, uh, yeah, the home rivers. And year before I fly there twice from Iceland and I didn't have any success. So it's actually... You need to be lucky. It's, it's, fish it's of cost a ten thousand casts. Yeah, sort of. And then it might be happening that in one week I end up catching three of these. Yeah. Uh, and even the first one was not the biggest one. I appreciate all of them because like it's not come easy. And there's it's not even the easy river we were fishing on. And there are even people fishing for years without any success, mm -hmm. which are like local people. And then yeah, you might be lucky and might end up with catch of your lifetime. <sighs> How big do they grow, and how do you fish for them? You uh, using usually the big streamers. The fishing season start in November, and it's quite short fishing season. It's just November and December in Slovakia, mm -hmm. and you using a big streamers as they naturally be, uh, eating the other species of the fish. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much just swinging the fly through the through the pools, just making the steps and hoping to get lucky. Yeah. Do you do that night or do they chase uh, a day? Or? I was lucky also uh, over the daytime, but as a, they are predators, so they are taking advantage of the darkness for their hunt. Mm -hmm. And yeah, most of the fish are might be active in a, in, a, in the morning, which I'm not active, so I'm not really targeting <laughs> them in the morning. <laughs> and then over the, over the evening and, uh, and the nighttime. Okay. it's it, I mean, it is... I mean, it, it's definitely a trophy. I, I saw your fish uh, on Instagram, and it's some it looks like a meter long. And that's and more than meter long fish. Like I'm saying, I appreciate even 80 centimeter fish. Like the the first one was approximately we didn't measure that one. Like 80 centimeter fish, I was super happy. I catch it on the first day, on the fly. Like I was super happy. Then the second fish was 100, uh, 106 centimeter. <laughs> And I was already like flying, but we, we just met up with my friend in the morning on a river. He, he, I have a good friend which give me a lot of information. And if somebody is secret about fishing, then about the Danube salmon, you're double that secret mm -hmm. because they, they work for it almost the whole life where the yeah. fish are standing, how they're behaving, when they're feeding. They're standing on a different uh, time of the day when they're just like resting, and then different time of the day when they're hunting for the, for mm -hmm. the, for the prey. And yeah, I actually end up at that morning, I think on 10 cast, and I managed to get this one, which I, it was mind blowing for me. You know, you're you're having like small hope for this. It's like somebody coming to the Iceland. You know, for me, the the sea trout might be became like a little bit. I appreciate them, but you know, you're not getting excited about 80 centimeter no. sea trout anymore, that much or something. And then you're getting this over meter hooko, which is like when you see the creature, you have so much respect for this fish. You know, and when you are really able to land one of these, and after that, it was not very. It's it's different type of the fishing. You kind of need to casting to different spots. You know, for for Aoki, it was not 
it was good school what he was saying you know mm -hmm. then he left the 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 Slovakia and I decided to stay a little longer and on one of the last days I went for another session just completely alone and then when I managed to get the biggest hucho it was like 116 centimeter and it was it was awesome fish it's impossible to get a good photos of those fish if you're alone no that they, they just they're too heavy they just droop also holding that fish is kind of different because like they are so long yeah. so they are kind of bending in a uh, in a you know so what what is the limit in length to these things they i know they found some fish that one which was up to 150 centimeter that's insane and <laughs> might be even yeah and the thing is i mean when you have a fish like that that is predatory even if you find it it might have just eaten a two pound trout and it's just digesting and it's not feeding yeah. for another five days. Absolutely. That's what they're doing. So actually, when I when I managed to hook this one, I was just going for the evening session alone, wait in my pool, which I like because I know how to wait it. It's quite quite big river. And then suddenly you just had a hit. Three days, nothing. You don't have a hit. That's a thing also for the hook not so many people. That was a good thing that I actually show also the people, local people, that they have this size of their fish also in their rivers, but not everybody willing to take this fishing for a couple of days without any bite, mm -hmm. you know? it's. But mm -hmm. for some of the people, that's a thing. One bite makes a difference, and that's what you're willing to spend on a river, even if there's no bite. You know, I fly okay. year before and have in two sessions zero fish, you know? And then you suddenly have a, have a bite when you need to just set the hook strong as possible, that strip sets, and hold the fish absolutely tight, you know. Yeah. And then you're fighting the fish in com kind of completely darkness in a waist deep currents and stuff like that. It's incredible because the trout, the trout that feed on insects always have to feed. Yeah. Trout that feed on other fish, which are not sticklebacks, yeah. they're, you know, adult fish. Yeah. They only have to eat once a week or once every two weeks. Yeah. Or and that, that what was actually my first thinking, what I was saying that, uh, why he eat my fly? There was like really in a big pool where you casting step, casting step. That fish eat my fly, and it makes sense. Like you casting the fly, which is making the already run. You know, it's like swinging through. It's just behaving differently. There's also when you see the giant travelers when they are uh, chasing other fish, which is already on a hook, and they're just going around it because it's mm -hmm. already somebody chasing some fly, and that's exactly what is happening with the with the with the Daniel salmon. If they are on a hunt and they already see the your fly chasing or behaving differently that's why they're willing to take it oh, yeah. it's some unnatural behaving going it's like through. a sick fish or yeah, struggling yeah, yeah. Fish or, or, or some different fish already that's why uh, that's what i said at the beginning like they might be living in a in a couples when they're helping each other for chasing the this this white ah, fish so, so the thing is maybe the other fish is chasing scaring this very fish away very and very kind of often also i have information that they caught one one done in salmon and they continue fishing, and then within five minutes, they cut another one from the same pool. Uh, mm. I mean, it's like uh, fishing in Tung, uh, uh, no, in open highlands. When you catch a one pound char, yep. then all of a sudden, boom, five pound brown trout. Yep, so might do, 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 be. Yeah, searching, yeah. searching. It happens so many times. Yep. And they're it's just curious the about an injured yeah. fish, and they're trying to bite the tail, and then you throw a little streamer, nothing. Yep. I remember fishing a very cold river in the, in the east, which flows into... Uh, Lagerfljot, and they have some chars there, and I, I had hooked a couple of chars, and there's this big sort of man-made structure to protect the road from the river when it's mm. high, and there's apparently just been a carnivore trout, because it's way too cold of a river to support a trout population, so I'm fighting this tiny little char, and it's coming to me, and from the rocks just shoots like a 10-pound trout, yeah. just grabs, to grab it. grabs the chars sideways, I pull it away from him, he goes back into the stones and he comes back for the same fish and back into the stones. I told my friend who lives in Ailes that he went there again and again, never, never happened. Never, again, never happened. That's exactly what I was saying, that the people which are like targeting the, the Danube salmon also over the season when it's not a season for them and they're fishing for brown trout or grey link, very often happening that you're fighting the grey link and a uh, hucho will going to attack your, fi uh, oh. your fish. You know, and then you also this is a knowledge when you know where the fish standing, where they uh, mm, when when yeah. where they where they biting and stuff like that. Oh. So this come November, you know, you know, a hookah was spotted there in yeah, July. Yeah, yeah, and you remember that's the thing. Yeah. That's a knowledge that you know, which you just need to kind of yeah gain by by the time spent on the river. Actually, okay, mm -hmm. he managed to spook two fish over one meter in that 
Oof. in that time. He was just walking one time after I got that uh, second hookah. We're walking down the river. We're continuing fishing. And he, he started kind of swearing. And he almost stepped on one fish, which was about a meter. And he said it was right under his feet in the yeah. shallow water where he was resting. But I think that's very sort of common to these predatory fish, that they, when they've already eaten, yeah, they, just they will chilling. just go into the very soft yeah. water, yeah, yeah, yeah. spend as little energy as they yep. can, so they use all their energy on digesting. Yep. It's such a, such a different game and different aspects yeah. to take into account. I can see how somebody can get obsessed with fishing for hoo-ho. Yeah, 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 it's very easy. They're ghosts. Yeah. W- once you get the chance or get a bite or g- if you get the fish, like you landed that you are you are addicted on that thing. It's just completely different, and because it's just so little of them, kind of little of them, or they are like not every day catch. You just get obsessed. For some people, for big streamer fishermen, it's really something which people mm-hmm. love. So if we go back to Iceland, what what is your sort of plan for next summer for your personal fishing? Where what are you gonna try something new or just continue? Marching on with Skafta and trying to find new spots and no, I think um, yeah. Last year, uh, I was saying that I want to slow down with the sea trout fishing mm-hmm. and go a little more on the brown trout because in my area there's not so many brown trout. Like maybe fishing. go back to Husa. Well, probably <laughs> not. <laughs> but I'm just like going to finish the sentence. I end up fishing for sea trout anyway. Uh, yeah. It's just better, <laughs> you know, the fresh sea trout when they come back. I was like, hell yeah, I, I just gonna fish for sea trout. It's the best thing, you yeah. know. But definitely, I want to fish a little more for, for browns. And I'm not a salmon fisherman at all. And last year, I went to Langa, mm-hmm. and I enjoyed it the most. Just like these smaller rivers, with a single hand rod, getting this, let's say, small small salmon up mm-hmm. to 70 centimeter. I, I love it. It's just completely different. Just uh, maybe because it's so different for me, I mm-hmm. love it mm-hmm. so much. Yeah, it's definitely for us the sea trout is the change away from that scene. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We all go through phases in this. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, if we can expect to see you. I mean, I would encourage everyone who's listening to follow you on Instagram, Jungle and the Trout, uh, and and follow your adventures because you you're quite uh, active in putting stuff up there from your adventures. Yeah, from time to time. From time to time. Uh, one question: Where where does that? Because it's quite a. Uh, Strange putting of words, Junker Linda Trout. Where does it come from? Yeah, it's also like you were asking me about <laughs> my name on Instagram, uh, on the Facebook. Yeah. It was just completely made up. And I used to have an account, personal account, which was Junker in the Box. Like uh, fucking the head. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say that way. So I just come up with Junker in the Trout. And uh, my, actually, my friend, when I, when I just say that, he, he'll, he'll like it a lot and just end up like that way. And actually, yeah, I like it now. Great. Um, I think we've we've touched on all the points. I would I'd like to touch on you with you, Maros. Uh, okay. Just uh, thank you for coming. Thank I again uh, encourage our, our listeners to follow you on Instagram and and consider sea trout as an option and, and take good care of these fish. Definitely, that's something which yeah, these long long living trout. It's something if you behave nicely, we're gonna see in the next year. I think it's gonna be. Just increasing on the on the, on the sizes, and I believe it's a future of the ice. A big trout fishing. is an old trout, so absolutely, so and it doesn't need there. to be. It doesn't need to be the size wise. It just like enjoy the enjoy every every catch, and even like seventy centimeter trout can be very old. You see it on the head, and those mm-hmm. fish deserve a lot of respect. Definitely, I think that's a good message to end our interview on. Thank you. Yeah, thank you too.